Okay, I will be talking about the analysis resource and I'll be giving an overview today in half an hour uh, of the kinds of tools that are included in the analysis resource and the purposes and give some uh, detailed insight in a few tools to give kind of a broad overview of what we have. Um, and tomorrow, we're gonna to go into detail for each of these tools. So if, if tools are your thing, please uh, tune back in tomorrow. And uh, also that's gonna be probably answering more of the in detail question. The purpose of today is kind of to give you an overview of what you can uh, hopefully learn more about tomorrow. So the analysis resource is a companion site to the IDB. And the broad um, suite of tools that we have is subdivided into three main categories. The T cell uh, epitope prediction related tools, B cell epitope prediction related tools, and analysis tools. And um, again, like each of these and the subsets of tools that we have are gonna be gone into in detail tomorrow. Um, but I'll, I'll talk about an example of each of these today. And actually the analysis tools are gonna to be described in, uh, um, by Alex right, right after myself. So um, the T cell and B cell effort of prediction tools are um, similar in the sense that we are really here benefiting from the work that has been done in the IDB in capturing data on epitope recognition. So from the database, from the experimental data that has been determined, we have training data sets. So in the case of MHC binding, which is kind of the simplest way of uh, illustrating this, we have affinity data for specific peptides binding specific MHC alleles uh, with a certain um, Finding affinity, in this case, these are IC50 values. So we have this data for like a large set of peptides and having data like this, where you have a large number of peptide sequences and associated binding affinities, you can apply machine learning methods that are using the experimentally derived data and then try to generalize it. So uh, machine learning means you have your computer that develops a prediction method or a prediction model that then can take new peptide sequences and alleles. And here in this case, uh, gives uh, predicted binding affinities out that might come in the uh, um, as, uh, scores in some arbitrary scale or be binding affinities again, et cetera. So this is the idea of machine learning that you have uh, known true example data, this is your training data to then generate a model that can you can use to apply uh, to unknown data that you don't have measurement data for. So how do you get to the IDB tools? So uh, the easiest is to just go for tools.idb.org and you go straight to this page, but you can also go to the idb.org homepage, in which case you see here on the right, you have a link to the Epitope Analysis resource. You can jump right here to the different categories of tools, or you can go here to the menu that takes ultimately you back to this uh, tools.idb.org page. So this is what that page looks like, essentially our analysis resource homepage. You have again, the main categories of tools and I talked about them in the first slide, the T-cell epitope prediction related tools, B-cell and analysis tools. And uh, you can click here to go directly to them in more detail. But we also have here available um, the tools API, I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail that actually mimics what Jason has presented for the database where you have the ability to call cool tools directly um, from uh, programs that you might have written. Um, we also have the ability to download the tools uh, to have a standalone local version that you can run, which is specifically beneficial if you have very large data sets. And uh, talking about data sets, we have the, um, data sets available that actually uh, are used to train and to evaluate um, these uh, tools. And actually most importantly, maybe, if you have questions at the end of this talk or at, at any point in the future, there is this uh, link to the Help uh, Solution Center where you can find more tutorials and questions and subsections and also a, a link to email where you can ask your questions directly and so we, we really appreciate these. If you get stuck with anything, if something doesn't make sense, please ask a question. We'll try to get back to you within 48 hours or so and answer them 
um, as, as best as we can. Um, and it tells us also like what where the problems are in anything that we are providing for you. So uh, going into a little bit more detail here, specifically for the T-cell epical prediction tools, these are the different types of tools we have available and the most commonly used uh, and popular tools are actually the peptide MHC binding prediction tools. And I talked about these before, they'll take an amino acid sequence of a peptide or a set of peptides and then uh, predict the affinity of these peptides for MHC plus one binding. So I'll go into a little bit more detail here and explain kind of as an example how these tools work. So this is the homepage of this MHC1 binding prediction tool. And there are several main input boxes here that you have to fill out to make a prediction. The first one is the sequence that you're interested in. This could be as in this case in FASTA format, meaning that you have kind of the name of your sequence up top after a greater than sign, and then you have the sequence in single amino acid code, but you can also provide sequences that are just wide space separated peptide sequences or so, or so. Then you choose the prediction method. And um, there's a lot of prediction methods out there. These are the ones that we have currently implemented. Uh, on top, you always have as a default choice, the IEDB recommended prediction method. And this is something that changes over time. And I'll explain briefly uh, why in more detail tomorrow. So we are routinely running benchmarks. So where we take the different methods that we have for prediction and are trying to evaluate how well do they perform in a real life prediction task. So this is a data set um, where smallpox vaccine derived epitopes were identified in a very, very comprehensive fashion. And I'll be asking how well do the different tools that we have enable you to identify uh, the peptides that were actually ultimately recognized by T cells here. And you see essentially these ROC curves where you have in a perfect world, you would have a curve that goes straight here from zero to one. So that your true positive rate, if you, they capture all your positives 100%. And then after that, you would get your false positives from zero to one, uh, 100%. In, in reality, obviously you'll never be perfect, but these are actually very close to perfect here. And the area under the curve is, is, is the um, integral of, um, uh, if you sum these values up, one would be perfect, 0.5 would be if you were along this dotted line, which would be essentially a random um, sampling of uh, positive versus negative calls. Um, so anything above 0.5 is better than random. And here we are close to perfection, like we several of the methods out there. Um, uh, these benchmarks in, in this case have been guiding us towards choosing that MEC pan uh, ligand dilution as the most preferred method for um, predicting MHC1 restricted epitopes. That's why this is now here at the, at the very top of this uh, list and it's our IDB recommended methods. And again, as we're doing more benchmarks, we might update and change this choice um, going forward. We're being conservative though. We're doing these changes <laughs> um, only once we have like really good evidence and we wanna have a publication out there where we can document it and move it forward so that we don't willy nilly change our recommended method every few months or so. So once you have chosen a sequence and your method, you then have to choose what are the MHC alleles and peptide lengths that you consider in your prediction and you can enter them here and then you can submit them. If you have like a very long, Submission, uh, please enter your email address uh, to get like the results emailed to you directly uh, so that the server doesn't just time out as it's uh, processing the results. These are how the results look like when you eventually get them. You have at the top an echo of the input that you gave, where in this case, the input sequence, the name, the RCV Armstrong uh, GP protein, and the amino acid sequence of that protein are uh, repeated back to you. Um, and then the specific allele that is being chosen, uh, AO201. Uh, and, and then in your um, <clears throat> results table, you can download that actually as an Excel file. Uh, you have the allele, 
the sequence it was coming from. These are all from sequence one, obviously, the position of that peptide, the peptide sequence itself, et cetera, the score that the method outputs, and the percentile rank. So these percentile ranks are a common theme across the prediction tools that we have. Different tools often have very different scales of their output. So we've been trying to come up with a comparable scale that you can uh, combine different methods with. And this percentile rank is calculated by taking a million peptides based on um, uh, uh, human protein records, um, we, which are predicted for binding to the different alleles, where we then get like a score distribution. And we're saying like, what is this peptide that we are predicting here for compared to these 1 million peptides and how does it rank? So a low rank here is good. Um, that's uh, what I was, this is explained here. This is the score. And uh, uh, in this case here, this also indicates then we have this kind of help here everywhere that the highest score is a good binder. That's why a high score con uh, confirms to a, like a um, low percentile rank. For MHC2 binding, uh, the uh, kind of input interface looks very much the same. This is the same sequence method. Uh, allele choosing some extra parameters that you submitted. And again, tomorrow, we're going to go into much more detail for both of these. Um, these methods come with additional steps. So when we talk about, like, the, this is the list of peptides that you input, um, we also recommend things like uh, removing redundancy in your inputs uh, for class two specifically of not doing uh, tile peptides. Uh, overlapping by uh, most of the sequence because they're going to be uh, binding in the same way and it's just going to be the same peptide over and over again from the view of the T cell. Um, so these additional steps we have been uh, summarizing and uh, making available in the TEPI tool uh, suite of tools where you go through a series of steps from one to six, which then guide you through your final result uh, rather than having to go through uh, manual or actually uh, computational steps that you would have to perform yourself. This tool does all of this for you. It has, it, these are still, the TEPI tool predictions are still based on the same tools that you can uh, directly access in the IDB, but here they are kind of wrapped in, in a more um, <clears throat> straightforward, streamlined um, pipeline. And this is then the result you're getting you ultimately get this is just the one pep that you should be uh, potentially considering in this specific case. So for B cell uh, epitope predictions, um, again, you have the from the tools that ib.org page, you can uh, look at the B cell tools and you have the different ones available. Here, the main difference, uh, or like as, as a start, we're going to look at the linear epitope predictions, which um, look again like somewhat similar to what you saw before. You have to start always by entering a protein sequence, and then you can choose a prediction method. So in this case, uh, we have a number of scale-based predictions, and we have the bepi pet predictions, all of which are scanning a linear sequence without considering the structure in the protein, uh, and are identifying segments of this linear sequence that might be an epitope. You can submit these and then uh, get a plot like this back, where along the linear sequence, again, here the position of the sequence is plotted on the x axis. Um, you have now scores that are uh, corresponding to um, likelihoods of the um, segment of that protein being the target of antibody uh, responses. And you see a number of segments here that are in, in the yellow that are above the threshold that you can. Uh, choose here that's defined by default uh, thresholds that are, have been found in the past to work. In addition to this uh, plot of the scores over the sequence, you get the predicted specific peptides that these regions correspond to. So you have your L here, you have this uh, segment here, position from 90 to 24, et cetera, um, which then correspond to uh, the, the segments again in your input sequence that might be of interest, and you have a breakdown of the specific uh, residue scores here telling you how these segments were uh, coming about. 
So there's multiple different scales for this and methods for this. And uh, in the past, uh, many people, including ourselves, but also many others have found that making consensus uh, approaches uh, that combine different methods work better. And you see here, for example, that all of these different methods ultimately share uh, certain parts of the protein that are consistently called as being likely epitopes. So in terms of um, the, 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 the main difference, or I don't know the main, but one of the very key differences when we look at T cell epitope predictions and antibody or B cell epitope predictions is that the antibodies recognize the folded protein structure. So while the linear epitope predictions are um, uh, um, make intuitive sense and you can use simple machine learning methods for them, you really want to know how does that translate to what regions on the antibody antigen surface are potential targets for antibody binding. So here in this case, you can enter uh, for discotope specific PDP structures and actually get that 3D view and predict um, epitopes on them. So you have at the same time still a view like this where in the linear sequence, um, the score is being displayed, but you can then ask to not just show these on a linear scale, but look for the 3D view here and get uh, displayed on the protein structure, on the 3 d protein structure, where are the segments of the proteins that are predicted to be recognized by antibodies. So uh, that's kind of summarizing, again, like on a very, very high level and very briefly, uh, T cell related epitope predictions and B cell epitope related predictions. Um, as I said before, they, uh, if you want to run like large numbers of these predictions, probably your best bet is to download the uh, code for these tools and run that on your own computer so that you don't have to deal with timeouts and things like that that are always an issue when you're interacting with another server. Um, this is uh, the big advantage is you don't need internet connectivity, that nothing can, can time out. If you have large things, that makes a lot of sense. This is uh, free completely if you're on a not prof uh, if you're working as a not for profit or academia institute. Um, for, for industry, we also make uh, the, all these tools that we have available for a nominal fee. Uh, and, and contact please the license uh, email down here if, if you're interested in that. Um, when you have that standalone, you can run these in a um, regular executable, where you in this case here, uh, asking to call the NetMC PAN tool, run for a certain allele, certain length of peptides, and with a, a sequence input, you get the same kind of feedback from that um, command line tool that you would get on the server. Um, there's also an API version, as I mentioned before. So this is sending the predictions again to the tool server at LGI. The biggest advantage of that is you don't have to install anything on your machine. Um, but you also don't have to go through the web interface and click submit. So you can run these uh, through, a, um, through a program that you might have. And um, <clears throat> uh, again, like one of the biggest problems you don't have to install anything. So there's no dependencies on packages that might not run immediately on your computer or so. It's again, freely available to all users. Uh, there's no restrictions here and can be incorporated into the pipelines that you might have. And these are just examples how this looks like. So it's then essentially you're running a, a curl command or something like that, where you are um, uh, calling essentially the server with your parameters and you're getting feedback uh, from that server that looks very similar to what you said from the standalone. Um, and then again, this looks pretty much like this. Uh, okay, so this is the feedback. This is the input, actually, of your peptide and allele set that you want to make predictions for. And this is how cool it can look like that, that calls this, where you are actually then um, uh, have like a little wrapper around this uh, curls, where each prediction for a given peptide allele length um, is then running this server command, processes it, and, and gets um, the consensus percentile back. Okay, so I hope I summarized this in a um, useful fashion. I showed you how we have web-based tools where a user can go with your browser, you can submit your data. I use it all the time. 
and get predictions back on the web. If you have large scale data sets, you might want to run things in a standalone version, which can run on your own computer, on your own cluster. Um, you can download the code there and install it locally. Um, and then you have no uh, restrictions whatsoever. Uh, but there is some complexity to, the, to do that in terms of like the dependencies. You have to run it on Linux uh, because of some of the packages we have are only available there. Um, uh, again, like if you're a um, bioinformatics hacker person, this probably is your best bet. And then as a somewhere in between, we have the API, which actually we want to push much more and make much better uh, that allows people to run uh, code remotely. You don't have to screen scrape. You don't have to interact with the web pages, um, but rather uh, use the um, command, uh, use code calls to the um, server at the IDB and get results back in a way that you can integrate into your scripts and have no dependencies. Um, yes. So um, let me go back here uh, to the summary of what I was presenting. Um, the first stop is the IDB database. So I didn't actually say that at the start, but I should have. Um, all the prediction tools are, as, as I showed you, based on data that we have experimentally derived and trying to generalize them. So um, rather than doing that, if you actually have data available for your specific question, use that. Um, so the first thing, if you have a, a question or a problem, in, in, in my mind, should always be that you go to the IAB and ask, okay, who has looked for epitopes in the specific protein that I'm interested in? Has this been done before? And that's going to be better than any kind of prediction can ever be. Then, as I just said, the prediction tools that we have extrapolate from existing data. Uh, that is what machine learning is about, that you are looking for existing examples, identify patterns, and generalize them. We use our C curves and AUC values um, as our performance metrics to see how well these um, distinguish between different uh, sets of epitopes and rank like correct candidates better than incorrect candidates. Uh, again, it's a screening step, not confirmatory. Some people are uh, upset sometimes that we're saying your tool said this is the best um, predicted epitope, but it didn't work. Uh, that's actually completely expected. Um, we are not saying that the result of the tools is uh, an epitope. We are saying that the candidates that are being um, identified using these tools are your best bet of identifying epitopes, and they like to contain most epitopes, but not every individual prediction is going to be an epitope. Uh, so there is a need always for experimental verification. Um, the analysis tools, which Alex is going to talk about next, uh, uh, help examine existing sets of epitopes uh, and gain new knowledge. And Alex is going to say more about this, but so the prediction tools that I talk mainly about here are about identifying new candidates. Analysis tools, if you have sets of epitopes and you want to um, say identify non-redundant subsets within them, that's what you use them for. And here I stop, and I think I'm slightly ahead of time. <laughs>